Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Richard Benton with the Bible as Literature podcast. In this week's episode, Father Mark and I discuss the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 verses 22 through 30, where Jesus warns his own people that no prophet is accepted in his own country. Hearers of the story usually equate this with the demeaning American expression, who do you think you are? In fact, Jesus' people esteem his position, coveting the benefits of his honor for themselves. Working through the storyline, Father Mark and I discovered that Jesus' people were enraged simply because Jesus illustrated, through the story of Elijah and Elisha, his loyalty to his father's teaching over loyalty to his own people. So incensed were all those in the synagogue that they physically threw Jesus out of the city. Why was the story of Elijah and Elisha so painful? Jesus did not recognize the difference between insider and outsider. Instead, he fulfilled Isaiah, bringing good news to the poor without distinction. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 27 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Today, we wanted to talk about this past Sunday's gospel from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, which deals with the question of the prophet in the midst of his own family, in the midst of his own country. Looking at the lectionary, looking at this reading, for me it's very clear in the text that it always comes back to the question of loyalty and the coming kingdom and one's status relative to the coming kingdom, and what that says about your identity and whom you identify with as family. Right, and when you are a teacher, and more importantly, a prophet, your loyalty is with one thing, and that's with the teaching. Anything that falls out of the purview of that teaching is irrelevant. And so the question of loyalty becomes a problem when the essential loyalty is tribal. Tribal loyalty makes sense because if one person has something, you can count on that person to help you out when you're in need and therefore you don't have to fear what you're going to eat the next day. Loyalty is very important and I want to emphasize like you did father, the importance of loyalty for family outside of the United States. The United States we have a system where we don't need to have loyalty to family. But I had a friend who worked in West Africa in Bamako and if he knew a guy that had a photocopier and he needed to make a photocopy, even if he had to go all the way across town to his friend, he was expected to go to his friend to use his photocopier and to pay him to make his copies than to go to the closest place. because that that loyalty is expected and is necessary in order for the tribal system to work. And this is where the tension is, because in this kingdom which is to come, people who threaten the well-being of your tribe or family or nation, people who threaten your security, people who threaten the accepted ideology of the group of which you are, humanly speaking, a part of, those people are threatened by this idea that you don't belong to them. It's very similar in the relationship with parents, right? As we hear in the gospel elsewhere, the Lord came to create a division in families between fathers and sons, between mothers and daughters. The division that is created is this dividing of loyalties. It's not that it breaks the relationship. It just changes the terms of relationship to, I am loyal to you, the human being, to, I am loyal to God, and because I'm loyal to God, I'm going to treat you correctly. But that also means I have to treat those who oppose you correctly. And therein lies the rub. In a previous episode, I said that the difference between peoples is not this nationality or that nationality. It's who stands with God and who doesn't. 
correct. Those are the only two categories that apply in Scripture in the Gospel reading. First, Jesus stands up and he reads from Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, who are the people that are to be served? They are the poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. Now, does it say which ones? It doesn't say which ones. It just says that they're supposed to be looked after. He does not mention nationality. Is that because Isaiah left that part out, or was it already understood? No, because later on in the same book, it talks about people coming into Israel who were not part of Israel, saying that the national borders are not relevant. National borders meaning the psychological borders, not talking about geographical borders. And then he says it was fulfilled in your hearing, and then everyone was excited. All were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. Is this not Joseph's son? Well, of course they say this because, ah, we know him. We know his family. I remember when he was just a little guy. Now we have this great speaker and this great prophet in our midst. Aren't we so lucky that we have such a guy as this? They're laying claim to him. They're laying claim to him. Is not this Joseph's son? They're not saying this to belittle him. They're saying this to lay claim on him. Right. He belongs to us because we, we, me and Jesus, we go way back. We know Jesus. We're really close with Jesus. We know Jesus is going to favor us. Now. So now that he's the son of God, now finally Israel will have a champion. Exactly. We That's lucked out. The issue. We right. lucked out. Jesus is one of our guys. Yeah. It's if like, he were yeah. a Roman, we'd be in very bad shape. But he is one of our guys. We're lucky. So the people of Israel should be all set. They're all set. Yeah. They're all set. And then Jesus says, no doubt, you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Hey, Jesus, that was awesome what you did for those guys. Now, since you're our guy, we want you to be serving us. So we expect something from you now because this is the tribal order. Why correct? are you siding with our enemies? Why are you a self-hating Israelite, Jesus? It's fine that you took care of the Gentiles. Now, what are you going to do for your own people? We got you to where you are. We put you on the throne. When your dad needed money, I lent him money, and he was able to feed you. You owe me, Jesus. After everything I did after for you. After everything we did after for you. After all we sacrificed for you. Why can't you say what we want you to say from the Amvon? For heaven's sake, Jesus. Why can't we control the logos that comes out of your mouth? Exactly. And the answer is, it's not Jesus' word that he's speaking. You don't own him. You can't control him. Right. And that's why he says, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. It doesn't mean that they reject him and they want him out. It's they reject him as a prophet because as a prophet, his loyalty has to be precisely and exclusively with the teaching and with the gospel. This is why. This is exactly why I do not accept the Western Christian attitude that the priest is one of the people. The role of the teacher, and I say priest, I'm not talking about clericalism. It's the one who teaches. You are a lay teacher in the church and you hold the same authority with respect to the gospel because of knowledge. The one who holds the authority of that knowledge is in an exceptional position, period. It's not up for debate. You want to deny the exceptional status of the one who bears the knowledge of the gospel. You want to claim that he or she is no different than anyone else because you want control and because you want validation that your lack of knowledge of scripture is okay. It's a huge psychological Dysfunction. Even worse, your lack of loyalty to the gospel. The loyalty is what produces the ascesis of study. And so you forego loyalty because of sloth, as we were taught. Right? Exactly. That's what it boils down to. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. In other words, in Jesus' political constituency, there was suffering in Elijah's constituency. But what did the father of Jesus do? Did he send Elijah to shore up business within his own camp? I love how parishes, when they talk about how to spend their money, always say we have to first make sure the needs of the community are taken care of because it's prudent before we look outside. But that's not what Luke is saying. It is prudent, but according to worldly terms, according to tribal terms, which are counter gospel. Exactly. So what did the Lord do? What did the Lord instruct his prophet to do? Not to take care of the people of Israel, but to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath 
in the region of Sidon in Lebanon, parenthetically, to a woman who was a widow. So he sent the prophet to the Gentiles, especially when Israel was suffering. And it goes on, and many lepers. So we're not just talking about a great famine. We're not just talking about the problem of starvation, but there was disease in the land. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So you have this beautiful situation in the Older Testament where the people in Sidon and the people in Syria, their needs were put before the needs of God's constituency. People imagine that they're God's constituents and he keeps telling them, no, you didn't put me in office. I'm here because I'm here. And the expression, my people, is my expression and my statement, not your statement. So if I want to say that the people in Sidon are my people, and I want to say that the people in Syria are my people, that is my prerogative. And guess what? As you were saying in Isaiah, which was the headline of this pericope, they are all my people, and I make no distinction of nationality, because my people have no place to lay their head. My people are the citizens of my kingdom, which is to come, in which there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, male or female, Catholic or Protestant, Jew or Gentile, etc. And this can lead to other problems, too, because look what happens in the modern day. Elijah then becomes our saint. Elijah came to Sidon. He's ours. You can fall into the same trap, and you can say, oh, well, since he came to us, then he's ours. Now, what do you think? Elijah owes you one? What if Elijah decided to go somewhere else? What if Elijah happens to be popular among somebody else? Then this becomes the same mentality, just going down a different path. But it's not going along the lines of Elijah as serving exclusively the gospel. And so the teaching of Isaiah that the only one that he has sent me to, that's interesting, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, you know me to preach the gospel to the poor. The initial command is to preach the gospel, and it's to the poor. This is where the loyalty has to lie. If someone was with the gospel, then the healing, the preaching has to go to the one who is suffering. So the human being who makes a distinction among these suffering people or those suffering people or these blind people or those blind people or, or this these... denomination or that denomination or this sect or this religion or this nation, all of these different categories. They're human categories. Correct. They're human categories and they go against this and Jesus uses this pericope of Elijah to say, well, if this is the case, if these are the chosen people, why did Elijah go to these non-chosen people? Why did the Lord choose these non-chosen people to be ministered to? But according to whom are they not chosen? This is the issue. This shows you yeah. that the human understanding of who is chosen and who isn't, who is in and who isn't, are non-functional. Not misplaced, they are non-functional. Which means that Paul, and this is the point about Galatians we've made in the past, Paul's dispute is not with circumcision, it's with how it functions for people who imagine that they are God's constituency. That is the issue. And if you are a prophetic teacher, you are always preaching against this destructive function. And where does it end up? So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. How could Father question the rightness of our religion and our church, the rightness of our cause, the rightness of our programs and our activities and our agendas? How could the teacher question that? Why aren't you loyal to us? Why aren't you defending us? It, we put you there. And if you read further in this, what's the reaction of the people? They were filled with rage and drove him out of the city. Exactly. They couldn't stand because he demonstrated that he was not loyal to them, so they drove him out. So where did he go? Capernaum, the place where they said, you did these great things in Capernaum, now do them here. He said, okay, if you're going to drive me out, I'm going to go back to Capernaum. And there he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority because he's speaking the gospel. And then... It ends with this, at least the, the lectionary section ends, with this beautiful mechanism you find in Paul's letters. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Yalla, bye. Okay, I'm washing my hands of you. It's like when Paul is, you know, addressing the Romans in his epistle. He doesn't go to Rome the way that people make pilgrimages to Rome. And Rome is the apple of the eye, the center of the empire, the cat's meow. No, for Paul... I was traveling to Spain 
And since I was passing through, I thought I would have a chat, meaning that Rome is not the center of the universe and not Paul's destination. It's a veiled insult. It's the same mechanism here. It's like, okay, I'm just passing through anyways. I'll head off and go back, you know, wherever I'm going. And the only other place that Paul talks that way about is about Jerusalem. Right. The center of the Jews. So, so the center of the, the Jews. The center of the Gentile world and the center of the Jewish world. And Paul makes it a point to say, yeah, yeah. okay, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, was in the, I was near Jerusalem, so they came out and visited me. Right. You know? <laughs> and I happen to be going, and I'm going to Spain, and so I'll stop in, I'll stop in Rome. Right. You know, he makes this point. But the great thing is the way this pericope ends, you know, after he's teaching, there's the man who's possessed by demons, and what happens? He says, leave, and the demons leave. Immediately, This is a great contrast. When he preached the gospel to his own people, they kicked him out because they can't handle not being his right-hand men. But he is the one who sends the demons out in order to heal the Gentile in Capernaum. It's powerful. It also reminds me of the story of the swine, which we read, I think, what, just a couple Sundays ago. People look at that text and they see the swine getting drowned. And it doesn't click with people that the swine are the Gentiles and drowning in scripture is a metaphor for baptism and that the swine actually are submitting to God's instruction which consigns them to death in baptism but someone who is stuck in this paradigm of Jew versus Gentile right versus wrong the good group versus bad group is going to say the swine got what they deserved which is exactly how it functions in life right? so you have to always go back to this teaching that challenges us to say if any human being needs help they need help and you have to push yourself as the text pushes us to actually self-identify in opposition to your group your community your family your tribe your institution you have to self-identify in opposition with your own so that you would never fall prey to not loving the other and then from the position of the other serve your own as well to create a context for mutual acceptance and fellowship which is the kingdom of God thanks so much Dr. Thank you very much much. thank you you've just heard the Bible as literature thanks for listening